Sleep, baby Egypt. Sleep. All right, now that she's asleep. Hey, we can't let Egypt see what other rivers are like. I love rivers. They go from uphill to downhill. They're important. And if they're used right, they will make your built world absolutely amazing. They always start as mere runoff, flowing down land. But with enough time and rain, they will create a riverbed that will carry more and more water and make it more and more river-like. Rivers are literally the definition of the path of least resistance with no foresight. The water will always flow to the lowest point available, whether or not it makes the journey to the sea shorter. This is why rivers can look like this. They are fed by any source that gives off liquid water, though generally the water should collect somewhere. Often mountain or hill valleys can collect runoff from nearby rain or melting snow, and ponds and lakes tend to be well collected and stable sources. Be careful with glaciers though, as glaciers by nature aren't renewable like seasonal snow or rain. Melting glaciers can provide a lot of water and can drastically change a landscape, but they may not last long enough to provide a civilization bearing river. Rivers at high elevations and on hard or rocky soil tend to have more waterfalls, cataracts, and shallow areas. All bad things for growing a large civilization on its banks. Rivers at low elevations and soft soils can be deeper, lazier, and windier, as it's easier to erode the banks away. Though because of the relatively flat land along the river, flooding is monumentally dangerous in these areas. Speaking of flooding, most rivers do that every so often. Flooding is simply when there's more water than the river can hold. It's exacerbated when the river floods into a populated valley or a flat area, and can be even worse if the area has poor drainage. The water and anything it holds, like wildlife, sediment, nutrients, and pollutants, all go into the surrounding area. When the floodwaters recede, all but the wildlife remain on the land, recharging the surrounding soil, which may have been depleted by agriculture or natural vegetation. The way a river floods is very important, and it's mostly due to the weather. If the source of a river experiences predictable winds and heavy rains during good planting times, and only during good planting times, the river will be great for agriculture, such as the case with the Nile River in Africa. If the source experiences heavy rains at irregular times or when the crops are trying to grow, the river will destroy the crops. Unhelpful floodwaters can absolutely fuck over a civilization, destroying architecture, irrigation systems, social orders, and spreading disease. I often see people draw rivers unrealistically, believing that a single stream can divide into two halves in the middle of a landmass. It doesn't happen like that. Rivers will all run into each other and form the largest stream possible for its watershed, which is anywhere where water ends up in a certain river. Huge rivers have a bunch of these tributaries, which is what makes them huge. Distributaries, where a river breaks into two, do happen once in a while, though 99% of the time they are in tiny creeks or due to man-made structures. Anytime this happens, unless by some massive dwarven architecture or something, it's not noteworthy on a large-scale map. The exception is a river delta, which happens when the river meets the sea. River deltas are branching off sections of a stream right before it meets the sea, with islands formed between each branch. The entire picture ends up looking like a plant with the top of its root system poking out of the ground. The opposite of a delta is the mouth of a river, which is just where it flows into the sea or something else. They always end their own journey by meeting up with another river, the ocean, or going into a lake that has no exit point for the water to go, which would have to be surrounded by steep hills that the lake could never breach. Depending on how high its surroundings are compared to the bottom of the lake, there'd have to be relatively equal amounts of input from the river and output from evaporation to keep it at a level where it doesn't break through its surroundings and create an exit point, which would eventually lead to the ocean. Here are some extra videos about river geography that you might find very useful. I found them very useful in researching for this video, and they're quite interesting. So let's talk specifically about how civilization develops with rivers. Rivers provide food, water, irrigation, and transport for civilizations that use it. 
especially if it runs through an otherwise hostile area, cities will tend to hug the river. This makes it easy for multi-city power to arise as the river allows them to control and survey population centers. They don't need to worry about controlling any pesky borderlands because they'll just keep everything that's on the river, which may be the only wealthy places in this otherwise hostile region. This is why Egypt had a central government to rival that of Louis XIV 4,000 years before him. Compare that to some place like Mesopotamia, where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers created a fertile region between them. Cities in this area could enjoy the many benefits of the two rivers without having to surround one main channel. This is one reason why independent city-states popped up around Mesopotamia and not Egypt. Rivers also facilitate trade, but the amount it does this is based on its navigability. It's more efficient to have a large ship carry a lot of goods from one place to another, but most rivers can't hold large ships like that. So what makes one navigable? Eh, there's no real clear answer or science to this. It's usually based on a case-by-case -case study. Generally, though, they should have a rather deep channel that is wide enough for a ship to sail in it. Although, if the channel isn't very deep, people will tend to make shallower boats so they can still trade on it. Ingenious ones they are. Other than that, they should be relatively free of rapids, waterfalls, and generally anything that could absolutely destroy something traveling on it. It should also be thoroughly explored to see if or where the previous two things would be a problem. Needless to say, there needs to be people up the river to trade with, or at least something to do up there. Maybe there'll be a Krispy Kreme. Yeah, give me a cinnamon twist. Because water is often a scarce but very important resource, rivers can be turned into religious symbols pretty easily. People can gain religious or political power by controlling its waterways or its source, or appearing that they control them. Controlling the source of another civilization's river is a strategic advantage, but having multiple powers on the same river can be dangerous. This is one reason why China will not let go of Tibet, because the Yellow River starts in its mountains, and having another power upstream threatens China's core. Though defendable, it is still an easy route into the heart of China that the country wants to have full control over. Rivers also serve as good natural boundaries and borders. The Roman Empire stretched from Spain to Iraq, and from the Red Sea to Scotland, so why couldn't they fully penetrate into Germany? Well, it was not because of the Rhine River, but after some crushing defeats on the eastern side of it, the Romans drew the Rhine River as a symbolic border between their supposedly civilized empire and the wildlands of the Germanic tribes, though the Rhine is a big physical barrier to overcome when leading an army across it. People tend to underestimate how difficult and dangerous river crossings actually were. When going into an untamed enemy frontier, there's seldom someone who will ferry an army across. Often what had to happen is bridges would be built across the rivers. Bridges are a massive strategic resource, as they act like a choke point for oncoming armies and allow for relatively safe and easy crossing of the river. You ever read Ranger's Apprentice Book 2, The Burning Bridge? Bridges are important! But constructing a bridge over a major river takes a long time and uses up many resources. Even then, an army in the middle of construction or being ferried over is very vulnerable to enemy attacks. Plus, bridges can easily be destroyed or burned. Again, Ranger's Apprentice, good series. But having your bridge destroyed behind you would leave you and your army trapped in enemy lands, which is terrible for morale. They can also be used by the enemy, so it was common practice to destroy it when it wasn't needed anymore. Even a small stream can change everything. In the midst of battle, anything that bogs down ground troops is advantageous to the other side, so forcing an army to cross a stream, or better yet, a large river, in front of you, is a mini jackpot. Rivers can be awesome, and they can really suck. I personally think that the benefits, food, water, irrigation, trade, a defensible border, outweigh the disadvantages. What? I'm gonna say, rivers are definitely strategic geography. War. And he puts a pack of emus. Mate!